1921 with his newest ship, the Arethusa, damaged at sea off the coast of Nova Scotia. Bill McCoy went to Halifax in an attempt to bring the vessel into a local port for repairs. The situation was risky, as Canadian custom officials threatened to seize the vessel and its cargo of contraband liquor if it arrived at the dock. A chance meeting in a Halifax hotel lobby between McCoy and a member of the Fouquet family from the tiny island of St. Pierre and Miquelon would make the unscheduled trip to Halifax very profitable for both men. St. Pierre and Miquelon, located just 20 kilometers off the Buren Peninsula of Newfoundland, had a long history of smuggling. But more importantly, it was a French-controlled territory free from the laws of prohibition. Mr. Fouquet was a ship's agent and a merchant from St. Pierre. He recommended that McCoy instruct his vessel to sail to the island for repairs. The repaired vessel and its cargo would eventually complete its journey to Rum Row. And as a result, Bill McCoy would establish St. Pierre as the hub of liquor distribution on the east coast of North America for the remainder of Prohibition. And McCoy was not a gangster, he was a gentleman. So he was able to be introduced to the uh, merchant social circles as well as the government officials. Um, he apparently met with the governor while he was there. They said, well, you know, you know, there's a fortune to be made with this. Business on St. Pierre grew so quickly that available warehouse space filled almost immediately. The island's residents began to rent space in their basements and sheds for storage. Demand for storage was so high that new warehouses were being constructed all over the island. Almost every building along St. Pierre's waterfront had a connection to the liquor business, and ships were free to tie up at the town's dock to load their goods. In the warehouses, every bottle of liquor was purposely removed from its wooden liquor crate and repackaged in a distinct burlap sack. Known as a burlock and invented by Bill McCoy, each package held six straw wrapped bottles. With ears sewn into the top of the sack, the burlock was easy to move and took up less space in cargo holds. The process of repackaging bottles, however, left thousands of discarded wooden liquor crates in St. Pierre. From what I understand, the, uh, the height of it, it was about 350,000 cases. All of this was uh, readily available to local residents or even to Newfoundlanders that would come with their skiffs, pick up these boxes and dismantle them uh, neatly to make houses. Others was just burned to get rid of them or others could be taken home for uh, renovations, building floors or, or to use for firewood. There was so much liquor business going on there that you see still standing there are houses that are made out of the liquor crates. The emergence of St. Pierre as a viable port and its proximity to Canada would completely rearrange how Canadian distilleries exported their products. American gangsters would travel to the province of Quebec, which had already repealed its prohibition laws. There, they would make their purchases often paying the distillers with briefcases full of cash. Sales orders were sent by telegraph to St. Pierre, where the product was loaded onto boats that were sailed directly to Rum Row. In 1922 alone, 500,000 cases of liquor passed through the port of St. Pierre, and more than 1,000 vessels entered its harbor. Located between St. Pierre and Rum Row is the province of Nova Scotia, which became a vital part of the Golden Highway, a term used by sailors that described the sea route running from St. Pierre to the American coast. Yarmouth became a prominent rum running focal point because it was the closest point to the United States from Nova Scotia. There were some boats that made a direct uh, voyage from St. Pierre to Miquelon right to the United States. But what became efficient was for a mothership, which would be a large coastal freighter, 
What they would do is they'd load up in St. Pierre with thousands of cases, come down to just off of Yarmouth, and then the wireless operator would contact the, the little depot in uh, Yarmouth area, and the boats that were anchored tied up in Yarmouth, the fleet, the rum running fleet as it were, they were like eight or nine boats, they'd go out and meet the, the mothership that was coming from St. Pierre and Miquelon loaded down with a full load and uh, finish off what was called the Golden Highway, which was from St. Pierre and Miquelon to the coast of the United States. American lawmakers never expected the smuggling that occurred by sea. And as a result, prohibition enforcement agencies were ill-prepared and completely overwhelmed by the volume of illegal activity along their coast. The initial enforcers of this law was intended to be the newly formed Bureau of Prohibition, which was part of the Department of Treasury. Uh, in conjunction with that was going to be the Bureau of Internal Revenue because it dealt primarily with issues of taxation and law enforcement. Those were the two primary uh, treasury agencies that were expected to enforce the new law, along with customs in the event of liquor being imported into the United States. The U.S. Coast Guard unexpectedly received a major role in prohibition as the agency primarily responsible for marine enforcement of the new law. In 1927 alone, the U.S. Coast Guard estimated that 158 boats were actively working the American coast in cooperation with an inshore fleet of several hundred smaller speedboats. It's the 1920s equivalent of what we now in the 21st century call mission creep. Uh, initially, the Coast Guard was intended to uh, serve as a means by which many customs agents would be able to get out to boats that were out at sea. And eventually those, that mission grew into a larger capacity. The bureau that was in charge of, didn't have any Coast Guard vessels, didn't have, you know, they, they had been thinking of land never at sea. And it was McCoy's foresight from that opportunity, from being in Florida, being so close, to the Bahamas of saying, well, you know, I can buy whiskey there and, and I can uh, uh, take it and unload it, which was a very good idea because nobody knew how to do it. And it took them quite a while to get organized. And what they did catch uh, was a very, very small percentage of them. At its peak, there were about 200 Coast Guard vessels battling the rum runners at any given time. Spread those 200 vessels along the coast, however, and that translated into one vessel for about every 40 kilometers of coastline, leaving plenty of room for the rum runners to operate. The U.S. Coast Guard was increasing the number of patrols and using faster ships with improved surveillance techniques. Soon the slower moving fishing schooners with their tall masts and huge sails were obsolete. The smugglers adapted by building new boats that copied the design of World War I subchasers. These vessels were fast and were usually painted a drab gray color to camouflage them with the horizon. And the profile of their hull was low in the water. The builders constructed bulletproof wheelhouses to protect the captain and the uncovered pipes that ran from the engine into the funnel. If pursued by the Coast Guard, a bucket of oil might be poured onto the red-hot pipes, which would create a smoke screen so thick that a vessel could disappear. In September 1928, a New York-based gangster named Big Jamie Clark arrived in Lunenburg to buy a schooner, wanting a boat that could carry a large cargo and at the same time evade authorities. He found the schooner I'm Alone tied to the dock. Clark reportedly paid a bargain price of $18,000 cash to take possession. The I'm Alone was now 100% owned by the American Syndicate, but remained registered in Canada. However, before it could leave the dock, Clark needed a captain for his vessel, and he chose John Randall for the job. Randall was best described as a daredevil at sea. He served with the Royal Navy during the First World War and received the Distinguished Service Cross and the Croix de Guerre for his exploits while attacking a German U-boat. On March 22, 1929, the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Dexter sparked an international firestorm when off the coast of Louisiana 
it fired on and sunk the Canadian registered I'm Alone. Crew member Leon Mangi, a French citizen and a resident of St. Pierre, drowned while waiting for rescue. From prison in New Orleans, Jack Randall called the sinking of his ship a cowardly act and argued that he was sailing in international waters. The three mile limit had recently been extended to 12 miles as a result of smuggling. And the US Coast Guard maintained that the I'm Alone was spotted less than 12 miles from shore. The sinking sparked an international controversy with one member of parliament in Ottawa referring to the I'm Alone incident as an act of deliberate piracy or worse, an act of war. That was a serious, serious thing to happen. There was a lot of uh, correspondence back and forth between Ottawa and Washington that a British registered vessel in peacetime in international waters was sunk by an American Coast Guard vessel. The fact that the, the I'm Alone was clearly engaged in illicit activity was never really discussed in all of the arguments uh, and it was even mentioned I believe by some, a Canadian minister that yes it was there for the sole purpose of engaging in illegal uh, trade uh, and in vi clear violation of US law but um, the United States kind of downplayed that in the, in the diplomatic negotiations and made restitution for the ship and the crewmen uh, in the hope of ending the diplomatic uh, situation. At the beginning of the 1930s, as a result of the increased enforcement in both Canada and the United States, it was clear that bootlegging during Prohibition was becoming increasingly dangerous. In 1931, towards the end of Prohibition, the U.S. Coast Guard had a deadly run-in with another vessel registered in Canada. The rum runner Josephine Kay from Lunenburg was operating near the entrance to New York Harbor when it was encountered by a patrol vessel. The uh, ship was interdicted by a Coast Guard six bidder and uh, after repeated warnings to uh, uh, stop and be inspected, the ship continued on and uh, there were blanks initially fired to get it to, to, to heave to and uh, she refused. And finally they fired into the vessel, I believe with a machine gun and uh, at that instance, the ship was subsequently boarded by the Coast Guard, in which case they found uh, William Cluett wounded, um, who was captain of the, the master of the vessel. The Coast Guard reported that it seized $250,000 worth of illegal liquor and arrested 19 men, including the crews of the barge and the tugboat working with the Josephine K. Its skipper, however, William Cluett, a Lunenburg resident, died a few days later from his gunshot wounds. Captain John Kelly worked for the Canadian Customs and Excise Enforcement Branch. He patrolled the waterways of Nova Scotia during Prohibition. Kelly was said to never travel without his machine gun on deck, giving him the nickname Machine Gun Kelly. In an incident off the La Have Bank, Kelly encountered a group of five boats unloading barrels of rum. When the boats took off, Captain Kelly used his deck machine gun, killing one of the men on board. In many ways, the Atlantic coast was becoming like the Wild West. However, it wasn't only rum runners who were risking their lives. After one decade of prohibition, it was reported that 500 agents were killed in the line of duty. U.S. and Canadian law enforcers were making thousands of arrests and seizing hundreds of boats. The court systems were becoming clogged with prohibition offenders. To stop illegal smuggling, the huge American market must be given the right to once again openly consume alcohol. To bring an end to the smuggling, the laws needed to change. The repeal movement was gaining strength, while the support for the noble experiment was weakening. 